My turning point from being a Muslim terrorist began the day I spent the best ten dollars of my life to purchase a Bible. Perhaps the most crucial discovery I made was that the Bible is not simply a book filled with wise sayings and deep thoughts for personal meditation as is commonly thought. The Bible is many things, including a road map of destiny with many details concerning the future of humanity. For me, it was exciting to also realize that much of its focus is on the Middle East, where I was born and grew up. On a personal level, the Bible was also a mirror that showed me everything that was wrong in my own soul. You can only imagine what it did to this pride-filled Muslim when I studied detailed scenarios of the future rise and fall of Islamic nations and coalitions. I have taken courses during my college days in Psychology 101, English 101, and Sociology 101, but I never imagined taking a course on Futurology 101. Here I am not only talking about the predictive elements of the Bible, Pride is a disease worse than anything else that we could ever deal with. The effects that Hitler and Nazism had on the German people were far worse than the effects that the drug epidemic is having on modern-day America. Today, we see the rise of a similar pride epidemic that is growing on an international level in 50-some Muslim states across the globe. As a result, we could very shortly be dealing with several Islamo-Nazi wars on numerous fronts around the world. Does the Bible predict such a cataclysmic event with so many Muslim nations? The answer is absolutely yes. You can't imagine how I felt when I read the Bible and found so much that describes the Mahdi who I had learned so much about growing up. The shock to me was that while a character identical to my Mahdi was seen throughout the pages of the Bible, this character was not called the Mahdi, but rather the Antichrist. Were the prophets of the Bible Islamophobes? After all, the Mahdi to us Sunni Muslims was the rightly guided and awaited one. The Shia Muslims refer to him as Sahib al-Zaman, the Lord of the Age. This is exactly what the Bible calls Satan, the Lord of the Age, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. You might think that this is simply a coincidence. Once I am done demonstrating the dozens of similarities between Islam's system and that of the Antichrist, you will not be able to claim mere coincidence. But what should really frighten everyone is that this Antichrist story is not simply a nightmare story that one reads about in some ancient sacred texts, but it is rapidly becoming a reality right before our eyes. According to Islamic tradition, the Mahdi doesn't merely emerge as some vague great religious leader. He will return to reinstate the office of the caliphate. Islam directs its followers, quote, If you see him, go and give him your allegiance, even if you have to crawl over ice, because he is the vice-regent, the khalifa of Allah, the Mahdi. For he will pave the way for and establish the government of the family or community of Muhammad. Every believer will be obligated to support him. Briefly, the hadith or sunnah are the records of both the words and the deeds of the Prophet Muhammad. In other words, the Quran is thus says Allah and the hadith is thus says Muhammad the Prophet of Islam. The hadiths are crucial to understand when one debates with Muslim apologists. Whenever a non-Muslim brings up the issue of Islamic terrorism, the standard Muslim apologist will almost inevitably say something like, 
Show me a single verse in the Quran that teaches violence. This has been a common technique to throw off Westerners because whatever verse is given, it will then be explained away as speaking of self-defense or as commandments that were only given on one particular occasion. In other words, all the commandments in the Quran which call Muslims to jihad are obsolete and not applicable today. But this is sheer trickery, public image jihad kind of thing. The first response to such a question should always be this question. Do you consider Muhammad to be the best authority to interpret the Quran? In other words, is the hadith authoritative to the Muslim? This results in a Jesus-style checkmate because if a Muslim denies the authority of the hadith, then he is denying Muhammad's authority as prophet. Most often, the wiggly Muslim apologist will claim that he does not believe in many of the hadith, particularly the ones that you cite in the course of the discussion about violence. But this argument will always end when a powerful Quranic verse is given that states, All you believe, obey Allah and obey his messenger and those in authority among you. If you fall into dispute about a matter, refer it back to Allah and his messenger, if you believe in Allah and the last days. This is in Quran, Surah chapter 4, verse 59. After this, in accordance to this commandment from Allah, any Muslim who denies the hadith is not only denying Allah's commandment, but Allah himself. This is comparable to a Christian denying the New Testament. In reality, most wiggly Muslim apologists do not deny the hadith at all. They simply deny it in front of you. Few Westerners realize that Muslims are allowed to conceal the truth regarding this issue when speaking to non-Muslims. The Sunnah or the hadith is as important to a Muslim as the New Testament is to a Christian. This Sunnah is everything besides the Quran that came from God's Messenger. It explains and provides details of the laws found in the Quran. This is in the Hadith itself. There are no serious scholars today who would deny the 200 or so commandments found in the Hadith which promote nothing short of jihad by the sword, including unprovoked invasions for the sole purpose of advancing the worship of Allah. Always keep in mind the difference between Islam and Christianity can be summed up in one statement. Christianity is Calvary, Islam is cavalry. The goal of Muhammad the Khilafah, the Mahdi, and all obedient Muslims is to achieve one goal and one goal alone, to advance the only glory of Allah as the supreme God by jihad, invitation first, then war, until there are none left who will not say, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. The special title of Messiah, although retained in the Islamic tradition, actually is void of any truly biblical messianic qualities. According to Islam, Jesus will not restore the nation of Israel to the Jewish people, nor will Jesus' purpose be to save and deliver his faithful followers from the ongoing persecution of the Antichrist. In Islam, Jesus comes back as a radical Muslim, to lead the Muslim armies to abolish Christianity and to slaughter the Jews and to break the cross. As ironic and as perverted as that may sound, that is exactly what fundamental Muslims throughout the world believe and are waiting for. All in all, we have clearly seen that Islam is an Antichrist religion. But is there evidence that Islam is the Antichrist religion? Now we will examine hard-hitting DNA conclusive arguments to support our theory. 
When comparing Old Testament heroes with Messiah, it is common to focus on Joseph, the suffering Messiah, and David as the King Messiah. Joseph's rejection by his brothers signifies Israel's rejection of Christ. David is a type of King Messiah because Christ's kingdom will be established in Jerusalem. But the one character in the Bible that is virtually never focused upon when searching for types of Christ is Gideon, the warrior Messiah. Gideon is crucial if we want to understand what the Messiah will do during his war expeditions after he sets foot on the Mount of Olives to fight for the Battle of Jerusalem. Though it is rarely discussed, Christ, like Gideon, will fight against Midian. The Bible refers to Midian as Ishmaelites in Judges chapter 8, verse 22. They are the descendants of Abraham's fourth son with his concubine Keturah. Like Gideon, the Bible portrays Christ as fighting against the inhabitants of Arabia. God came from Timan, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise, rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Habakkuk 3, 3 to 4. Jesus in person returning from battle out of Timan in Arabia. How often is this discussed in churches? When was the last time we had a Sunday school? Today we will be discussing how Christ will come fighting out of Arabia. It never happens. How often is this discussed in churches? It needs to be. Jesus will physically return and will judge not only the inhabitants of Arabia, but also Kush, which includes the modern-day Islamic nations of Sudan and Somalia. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Habakkuk 3, 5-6. Midian refers to the regions east of the Jordan River and southwards on into modern Saudi Arabia. This is the heart of the Islamic territory. Portrayals of battles like this with Christ fighting against Muslim nations are actually found throughout the Old Testament. The enemies that come against Christ are described as this. They come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 9 to 10. The enemies like the east wind are the locusts of Arabia and the kings of the east. And in case someone thinks that this is simply one minor war expedition by Messiah against Muslims, but that the real showdown is with European Antichrist, as many think, consider the context of Habakkuk. It is the final battle of Messiah against the Antichrist, who is described as the most proud in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, who breaks the peace treaty and proclaims war in the name of his God. Then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense ascribing his power to his God. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 11. The book of Numbers, in one of the earliest, clearest, and most direct messianic prophecies in the Bible, also speaks about the coming of the Messiah to specifically destroy and conquer these same peoples. This prophecy was made by Balaam and was given to Balak, the king of the Midianites, a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the forehead of Moab, the skulls of all the sons of Sheth. Edom will be conquered, Seir, his enemy, will be conquered, but Israel will grow strong. A ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. Numbers 24, 17 to 19. The Messiah is portrayed as descending from Jacob and possessing the scepter, a clear reference to his future rule over Israel. These three names, Moab, Edom, and Seir, 
are all referring to the same general people and the same general region. It is the peoples who lived to the east and southeast of Israel. Is Europe located immediately to the southeast of Israel? Or is this the location of Arabia? Ezekiel 35 speaks of judgment of Mount Seir in verse 1 and connects it with Edom. As you rejoiced because the inheritance of the house of Israel was desolate, so I will do to you. You shall be desolate, O Mount Seir, as well as all Edom, all of it. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Greater Edom, encompassing the land from Timan to Dedan, which is today from Yemen to Saudi Arabia. When Jesus returns to take hold of his scepter and destroy his enemies, who are they? They are all the Arab peoples from the east of Israel. In Isaiah, the theme is repeated. The Lord will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. Jehovah has spoken. Isaiah 25 verse 8. Has this happened yet? Or is this referring to the period after Christ has returned? Unless death has already been swallowed up and I have missed it, this is clearly about the return of Christ. The hand of Jehovah will rest on this mountain, but Moab will be trampled under him as straw is trampled down in the manure. Isaiah 25 verse 10. God doesn't seem too worried about using polite or politically correct language here. Once again, the Messiah comes back to trample Moab. He is pictured as standing with his hand of blessing resting on Israel while his foot is pressing against the neck of Moab. For those who hold to the European Antichrist paradigm, why does God specifically mention Moab and not any nations from Europe? If you take a face value approach to interpretation, which is more reasonable to conclude that this passage is pointing to the final and time defeat of the modern day physical and spiritual descendants of Moab, or that this passage is allegorically pointing us to Europe? Let's get real here. The Bible simply does not teach a European Antichrist. The prophecy of Isaiah 63 concludes with the Messiah emerging out of Edom with his robes literally drenched with blood from the multitudes of those that he has slaughtered. That's right. Have you ever seen Messiah portrayed this way? He left as a lamb, but he returns as a mighty conquering lion. Who is this coming from Edom? from Bozra with his garment stained crimson. Who is this, robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, from the nations no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. For the day of vengeance was in my heart and the year of my redemption has come. Isaiah 63, 1 to 4. Messiah will even personally judge Lebanon. In Isaiah 10.34, an amazing declaration is made that Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. This is the Messiah who will judge the anti-Israel elements within Lebanon and all of Lebanon will bow before him. I can see some argue that uh, the mighty one here is God the Father in heaven 
and is not the Messiah on earth. Yet Isaiah 19.20 leaves no question. He will send them a Savior and a Mighty One, and He will deliver them. Who is this Savior? How is He sent? In the Psalms, Messiah is portrayed as the soldier and a fighter with the same reference, Mighty One. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O Mighty One, with your glory and your majesty. Psalm 45, verse 3. In Zephaniah 3, this Mighty One is in physically present in Israel's midst. The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One will save. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. It is clear that this is the Messiah. God the Father is utterly transcendent. He is not physically present in Israel. This prophecy regarding Lebanon is also the judgment against the Antichrist. O oh, my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. Isaiah 10, 24-25 Antichrist will be responsible for the destruction of Lebanon. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you and the plunder of the beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. Habakkuk 2.17 So why did the West miss this? It is common in the West when someone initiates a prophecy discussion that the discussion is immediately turned to the book of Revelation. Even on the most prophecy documentaries, they begin and revolve around allegorical passages from the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Why not start from the beginning of the book? Why not start with the many literal references in the Bible regarding prophecy? Instead of jumping right into an examination of the various allegorical visions and dreams about beasts, horns, dragons, and so forth, why not start with what is clear and straightforward? This would be a much more reasonable approach, would it not? When attempting to form a solid biblical basis for understanding the Antichrist system, one needs to rely on the full counsel of Scripture, not merely the last and most mysterious book of the Bible, that is the book of Revelation. While the prophetic snapshots found in Revelation or the book of Daniel are very important, they are only a small part of the much larger pool of information that the Bible has given us. Too many interpreters begin with these few snapshots and when their conclusions are not supported by the wealth of other prophetic passages, they usually either massage those passages to conform to their established presumptions or they just ignore them altogether. But we cannot take such a pick-and-choose approach again in order to form an accurate and truly biblical perspective on the end times, we must rely on the complete and full counsel of Scripture. In order for any theory or position to be convincing and more universally received by the church, it is necessary that all of the passages be sufficiently reconciled. They must all come together cohesively in order to paint one consistent picture. Now that we have laid the main foundation for this series, we will discuss specifics to link Islam as the Antichrist religion and the Islamic Mahdi as the Antichrist himself. We will start with comparisons of the Mahdi and the Antichrist. Then we will talk about specific actions the Antichrist takes that the Bible specifically warns us about. Finally, we will discuss the end goal of the Antichrist and how God has given us instructions for today's world 
and the coming days ahead.